don't use any words, okay? Just facial expression. Okay. What was your reaction to the end of the movie? But don't use words, okay? I'm gonna count you and do it all at the same time. Uh, Ready? How does it end? Three, two, oh one. Vieja amiga oscuridad, otra vez quisiera hablar, porque he tenido nuevamente una visión que suave va cambiando mi manera de pensar, la oigo hablar. Escucho en silencio. Well, it took me 11 films, but I'm finally here. We have a Star Wars film that I think genuinely, truly sucked. Yeah, if you stumbled upon my Attack of the Clones review, which you should watch before this, by the way, and assume that I hated all the other Disney films, I hate to tell you, but you're wrong. I think all the other four ranged from okay to great. I even thought Last Jedi was good. I don't think it's a masterpiece or anything, I'm not going to be doing a Diamonds in the Rough on it or anything, but I found it decent, if a bit silly and misguided at times. But this? We're not just talking about bad, we're talking Justice League bad, Last Airbender bad, Spider-Man 3 bad. Every other Star Wars film has at least one thing that it does better than this one, and after watching this in theaters, all four times... <sighs> I found myself the greater appreciation for every single one of them. So with that said, I'd like to both analyze what makes this film fail as a standalone movie, as well as its shortcomings against its contemporaries in the saga. That way, not only can we put the nails in the coffin of this terrible, terrible film, but we can do it while celebrating and appreciating Star Wars as a whole. Sequels, prequels, and everything in between. So right after the opening crawl, Kylo Ren is killing random NPCs we know literally nothing about in an environment we've never seen before, finding this Wayfinder thing to locate Palpatine. I mean, apparently he's on Mustafar, but I only know this because I searched it up after watching the film. But like Alex Jones in a debate, the film can't sit still for two seconds, so he immediately flies to an ice planet to find Palpatine. So basically, that two minutes of action was completely pointless and could have been cut out of the film changing nothing. If anything, Abrams would have saved money on effects. Palpatine then hilariously just announces that he created Snoke. This reveal happened so early in the film and is such a throwaway moment in the story that it basically means nothing, and this is how the film will treat a lot of its other reveals. Kylo reveals that he came here to kill Palpatine, which makes absolutely no sense. Palpatine isn't a threat to the First Order in any way at this point, at least not to Kylo's knowledge, and the Resistance is on their last legs. So you'd think that Kylo would be focused on crushing them, and not this pointless side quest that doesn't benefit him at all. But it's okay, because it turns out that Palpatine wants to help him, and even gives him a new fleet of warships that the First Order doesn't even need at this point. He agrees to give it to him if he kills Rey, a request that makes absolutely no sense for reasons I'll get into later. Right from this intro, I already knew this film was going to be bad. Let's compare it to my favorite intro in the saga from The Empire Strikes Back. Similarly to what happens here, we have a character going on a side quest. We also have plenty of action, but unlike what we see in Rise of Skywalker, we actually have the beginnings of something resembling an arc. Luke overestimates his abilities and self-reliance and gets mauled by Wampa for it with his Tauntaun dying as a result of his overconfidence. He saves himself by the skin of his teeth, relying on the Force by instinct, escapes to Wampa's cave, and is reminded by the spirit of Ben Kenobi that he still has much to learn and that he should seek out training. None of this feels like filler. None of this feels forced. This is how character development works, and it makes sense. In Rise of Skywalker, on the other hand, we waste two minutes with a pointless action scene and then watch characters make decisions solely to progress the plot and not based on any actual character motivation. Believe me, it gets so much worse later. Anyways, we need an excuse for the Resistance to find out about Palpatine, so we cut to Finn and Poe getting information from an informant who in turn has been fed information by a spy in the First Order. They get pursued by TIE fighters, leading to a lightspeed skipping ship chase. A lot of people complain about the science of this, but Star Wars is a fancy first and foremost, so I'll let it slide. We then cut to Rey's training, or at least the very end of Rey's training. We hardly see her interact with Leia, and she teaches her absolutely nothing, both in this scene and in the entire film. What a missed opportunity. Maybe we could have seen their differences in philosophies and skills. Maybe Rey has struggles letting go of Luke's death that get in the way of her training. Making Leia a Jedi is a genuinely interesting plot point that the film does jack shit with. I'm not sure how J.J. managed to make the final stage of The Last Jedi's training a completely pointless scene, but he somehow pulled it off. Poe and Finn meet up with Rey, and the film laughably tries to pretend like this trio has any chemistry at all. Poe didn't even meet Rey until the very end of The Last Jedi, and the film still wants us to buy that they're these wonderful friends. Hell, Rey and Finn haven't had a meaningful interaction since the first film. 
Remember when people wanted to argue that Anakin and Obi-Wan didn't have chemistry in the prequels because they bickered sometimes? Well, apparently, their relationship would have been improved by them not meeting until the end of Attack of the Clones. We cut to the Gathering of the Resistance, and here's where I get to the hot take part of the video. Because not only do I consider this the worst Star Wars film, it's also the worst acted Star Wars film. Putting aside that I think the prequels are phenomenally acted films, albeit with unconventional characters and clunky dialogue, the actors in those films are given something that the cast here doesn't have opportunities to explore their characters. I'll go more into this when I eventually review episode 3 for Diamonds in the Rough, but there are a lot of moments in these films where you can really appreciate the subtle choices that the cast brings to their performances that I personally think brings a lot of nuance to them. Revenge of the Sith in particular is, in my opinion, the best acted Star Wars film. It's because we get so many of those sweet character moments that this film doesn't care about. When Anakin is on Mustafar and he sees Obi-Wan on Padme's ship, his voice gets shakier and more strained as if he's still trying to convince himself he's in the right, even after destroying everything he ever cared about. You turned her against me! You have done that yourself! You will not take her from me! Anakin knows that he's doing something terrible, but his hatred and anger, plus a decade of emotional stunting in what basically amounts to a religious cult, won't allow him to admit it. Here, the actors don't have room to make choices like that, because they're not playing actual characters. They're answering machines and exposition devices. Their performances are horribly phoned in, with a script that gives them nothing to work with. Somehow Palpatine returned. Oscar Isaac's delivery of that line legitimately sounds like a critic reviewing this contrived and forced retconning plot point. It'd be funny if it wasn't so sad, because he's a good actor. But he's not good in Rise of Skywalker. Though, to be fair, this one random rebel played by Mary from Lord of the Rings is somehow a lot worse. Dark science. Cloning. Secrets only the Sith knew. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he just showed up to shooting shit-faced every day after reading this joke of a screenplay, and I don't blame him. Abrams has an infamous habit of directing his actors to be as loud and urgent as possible rather than actually understand their characters, and it's embarrassingly apparent here. Well, I tell this story about J.J. in the first film, I had to run onto the deck of the ship. Captain Pike, sir, we have to stop the ship. Kirk, how the hell did you get on board the Enterprise? And say something to Bruce Greenwood about something. Vulcan is not experiencing a natural disaster. It's being attacked by Romulans. Romulans. And I had, I just had no idea what I was talking about. That same anomaly, a lightning storm in space that we saw today, also occurred on the day of my birth, before a Romulan ship attacked the USS Kelvin. You know that, sir. I read your dissertation. And I asked JJ, I took JJ aside and I said, I'd, I'd love to do it one more time because I, I don't know what I'm saying. And if you could tell me what I'm saying, it would be great help. And he said, it doesn't matter. You just run on, you say it as fast and as er earnestly and urgently as possible, and no one's going to care. Because all the audience is going to think is, something's happening. Something's happening. <laughs> if the film is extra cruel, we'll get these really cringy comedic banter moments that are written about as forced as they're acted. Tell me what happened. You tell me first. You know what you are. What? You're difficult. Really difficult. You. You're a difficult man. You. Speaking of bad filmmaking, the Sith planet that Palpatine lives on is called Exical, which legitimately sounds like a word that L. Ron Hubbard came up with. Honestly, L. Ron writing this from the Bridge of Total Freedom would explain a lot. Stupid <laughs> humans. And yes, I know the Sith planet should be called Korriban, and yes, that pisses me off too, but I'm trying to stick with problems I have with the actual filmmaking and not fanboy jabs. Luke apparently wrote in his notes that a Sith Wayfinder could lead them to Exegol, and if you thought the film was convoluted before, now it gets so much worse as the film hops from planet to planet to retrieve MacGuffins to help them find the Wayfinder. Solo, a Star Wars story, had a somewhat similar plot, with the hero trying to retrieve a special item of great importance, but the difference is that it remained clear and focused. They assembled a team, mapped out a plan, and headed to the Kessel Mines. Both Solo and Rise of Skywalker have very simple stories at their heart, but their approaches mean absolutely everything. Because Solo keeps the objective simple, it has more time to naturally develop characters, something I'd argue does the best out of any of the Disney Star Wars films. We get to see Han lose his naivete and trust in others. We get to see Lando's transformation from a greedy lowlife to a selfless activist. We get to see Kira go from a helpless victim to criminal kingpin. None of this would have felt natural if the plot was constantly hopping around and overcomplicating a story that it didn't need to. Also, before some aggressively unoriginal, no-talent RLM wannabe feels the need to chime in, this isn't the same thing as Phantom Menace. Episode 1 is tackling the beginnings of the end of democracy and the political seeds that eventually spawn the Clone Wars. 
Rise of Skywalker is a fetch quest. There is no reason for the latter to be as complex as the former. Before Rey leaves, Leia tells her this. Never underestimate a droid. There's nothing inherently wrong with this line, but I just want to bookmark it, because trust me, it's really gonna bite this film in the ass later. We cut back to Kylo as his helmet is getting rebuilt by these admittedly pretty cool gremlin things. They feel more Warhammer 40k than Star Wars, but you won't hear me complaining about that. My issue is that they're rebuilding the helmet in the first place. Why? For what reason? To sell more action figures and add a couple skins to Battlefront 2? Is that where we've sunk now? Anyways, Kylo goes back to his ship wearing his new helmet, his knights marching next to him, and... I don't even know how to lead up to this. Knights of Ren. Goals. Ah! This is where I actually left the theater the first time I watched this film. Star Wars dialogue has never been the greatest, but this doesn't even feel like it belongs in the same universe as the rest of the film. Everyone likes to bash on the sand monologue from Attack of the Clones, but that at least had some basis in theme and character to justify it. I already covered it in my review of that film, but to summarize, it actually makes sense, given that Anakin grew up as a slave on a sand planet and was awkwardly trying to use Naboo as a metaphor for the softness Padme brought into his life. Someone please explain to me why stormtroopers from a galaxy far, far away are speaking in fucking Twitter lingo! How does this film exist? We're only 20 minutes in! Enough of that. If I dwell any more on that line, I'm just going to lose my mind quicker. So Kylo gathers his military leaders together and then explains that Palpatine plans on giving him a Sith fleet. One of his men asks what Palpatine wants in return, and Kylo, like a petulant dumbass, decides to choke him for the crime of asking questions. This fleet, what is it, a gift? What is he asking for in return? Does that... Not only does this make Kylo look childish and stupid, it makes his inevitable redemption that much more unlikely. Say what you will about Darth Vader killing or choking subordinates, but he only did it when they either failed him or undermined his authority. This guy was bringing up very valid and necessary questions, and Kylo humiliates him for showing more forethought than him. This isn't a conflicted anti-villain. This isn't even a murderous military commander. This is an immature bully who thinks hurting people for no reason makes him look tough. And this is the fucking guy who the internet claimed was more complex than Anakin Skywalker? We actually get a character with motivation who is interesting and is horribly, horribly flawed. If you really think he's comparable to the bitchy, whiny asshole that Anakin was in the prequels, then I mean, like, okay, great for you. Believe it or not, there is a difference between a character that is flawed and a character that is just so poorly written that he flip-flops all over the place like Anakin. What? So back with Rey, Finn, and Poe, they go to the sand plant to get the Sith dagger that will apparently lead them to a wayfinder, which will in turn lead them to Exegol. But they're interrupted when Kylo Ren Force projects himself to Rey, so we can hammer in the only notes these characters have. You're sad your parents left. You're mopey, you killed your dad! I'm going to find you, and I'm going to turn you to the dark side. This character is so one-dimensional that even with almost no dialogue for a third of the film, he still needs to spell out his goal. Keep playing that one note, Kyle. You might actually convince yourself you have actual depth of character. But before the audience has time to question what quote fanfic Chris Terrio is pulling dialogue from, Lando Calrissian shows up. He gives them directions to the dagger. We get this admittedly pretty cool speeder chase scene between Ray's party and a couple of First Order troopers. Honestly, this is probably one of my favorite action scenes in the franchise. It's well shot, well edited, the practical effects and CGI are combined pretty seamlessly, the speeder designs are cool, and the hero's methods of dispatching their pursuers is actually pretty creative. Unfortunately, it's what the scene leads into that ultimately ruins it for me. First, we get this really bizarre line from Finn. No! Ray! Ray! Ray, I never told you Ray! Huh? I say it's bizarre because we never learn what he planned to tell her, and the film doesn't even hint at what that line could be. I originally assumed that he was going to tell Ray that he loved her, but John Boyega himself has since debunked this rumor. We move from that utter incompetence to outright nonsense, as the quicksand our heroes find themselves in just so happens to be where the Sith Dagger is located. What are the odds? Look, I'm not as anal against coincidences as some people are, but this is just downright insulting to the audience, especially when Last Jedi was the only film where Rey has actively been challenged in any way instead of just handed things by the script. There are no stakes here. Unfortunately, C-3PO can't read the directions on the dagger because his programming forbids him from reading Sith. Why? I have no fucking clue. What possible practical use would that restriction have? That being said, this does lead into probably the best scene in the film, as the team is attacked by a Vexus, a six-eyed tunnel serpent. 
Rather than fight the animal, Ray notices that it's only acting in aggression due to a physical wound it suffered, and opts to heal it instead, absorbing the animal's pain. Not only are the practical effects some of the best in the entire trilogy, but it's very interesting to see Rey turn to non-violent means to solve problems of the Force. It shows some of the benefits of the light side that we haven't really seen from these movies, and seems a lot more in character for a Jedi than merely resolving the issue with the lightsaber. I'm dead serious, this is a great scene, and probably one of the best in the trilogy. I remember actually getting my hopes up around here that the film might actually be salvageable and pick itself up. Things continue to be strangely decent as we segue into this neat little action scene with Kylo charging towards Rey in a TIE fighter as Rey tries to prepare herself to take him out. The visual cues are straight out of a 50s western, and probably the only time in this film or Force Awakens where Abrams seems to care at all about the vintage roots that define Star Wars. Her method of cutting down the TIE fighter is pretty visually stunning, and while I'm hardly a fan of slow-mo, it's actually pretty well used in this instance thanks to some slick editing and direction. Hell, even Ridley's performance is alright. The stakes are increased even more as Chewie has been kidnapped by the Knights of Ren, with their ship already taking off, Rey showing noticeable strain and trying to hold the ship back with the Force. Could it be that Abrams has turned over a new leaf? Apparently not! Kylo, remarkably unscathed despite having just survived a fiery explosion of glass and metal, pulls on the transport ship, creating a tug of war between him and Rey. The struggle proves too much for Rey to contain, as she accidentally shoots a stream of force lightning, blowing up the ship and everyone in it, much to her horror. But because stakes do not exist in J.J. Abrams' action figure play session, it turns out that it wasn't the ship Chewie was on, so he's actually perfectly fine. It reminds me of when a little kid is playing pretend and play dies before creating some ridiculous excuse out of nowhere to explain how he didn't actually die. Only that little kid is being paid millions of dollars by the most powerful corporation in the world. I swear to you, as bad as the scene sounds, it is so much worse than I'm making it look. All of the characters spend like five minutes mourning Chewie like this is some meaningful, impactful scene before it gets immediately retconned. How have we even seen the mourning Chewie after it's revealed he's alive? Here's a good idea. Have a point. It makes it so much more interesting for the listener. Anyways, back to Rey and friends, we find out that even though C-3PO can't translate Sith and they no longer have the dagger, the inscriptions on the dagger are still in his memory and he can ultimately translate them with the help of a hacker. We also get this terrible dialogue that I'm pretty sure was only included because Terio just realized how utterly stakeless this dog shit script actually was. But if this mission fails, it's all been for nothing. All we've done, all this time. Oh, bullshit. If you don't succeed, there's no reason for you to believe at this point that you won't have some other insane excuse to justify your heroes winning. So anyways, the team goes to a planet called Kajimi. Jesus Christ, these fucking planet names are horrible. Pathetic. To hack C-3PO to read the encrypted message on the dagger. They then come across a bounty hunter named Zori, who apparently had a grudge against Poe. And I guess Terry and Abrams took my criticism of that abysmal goals line as a challenge, because this exchange somehow manages to be almost as poorly written. Not that you care, but I think you're okay. I care. This is one of the most defining aspects of a Mary Sue, which is, at this point, an extremely valid complaint to have about Rey. All the other characters in the story just like them for no reason, because they're the protagonist. The Last Jedi actually attempted to fix this with Rey, making her relationship with Luke start off rather rocky, and having Snoke outright humiliate her in the throne room scene. In this film, however, even characters she literally beats up and acts aggressive and antagonistic towards immediately take a liking to her, as if they watch the movies and already know she's the heroine. At this point, I'm beginning to question if Abrams and Terrio have ever actually interacted with other human beings in their lives. Nobody fucking reacts this way to getting the shit beat out of them. This film is everything wrong with characterization! Oy. Calm down, Will. So as a reward for beating her ass, Zori takes Ray and her company to a droid hacker named Babu Frick. Droid, remember I go black. Black, black. Apparently, this uncircumcised sentient sex organ with the voice of a meth addict has become a fan favorite, and I fail to realize why. This hideous monstrosity belongs to the fucking holiday special, and I say that as someone who likes Ewoks, Jar Jar, and Porgs. His voice is obnoxious, his dialogue consists only of action figure catchphrases, his design is grotesque, and his purpose in the story is nothing more than a MacGuffin. I'm just hoping he dies horribly and painfully by the end. 
When I see Bubble Freak in a commercial, I start to gag and almost throw up, and I have to look away and mute it. And when I see Bubble Freak in a stroller, especially when they're crying, I just want to put my foot through the fucking thing and step on it until it's nothing but blood and pulp on the fucking pavement! So we find out that although C-3PO can translate the encryption, it'll end up erasing all of his memory. 3PO reluctantly agrees before changing his mind, but it's too late as the team forces him to go through with the memory wipe anyway. Yeah, remember earlier when I said to bookmark this line? Never underestimate a droid. Funny how the film really only cares about humanizing and praising droids when it's convenient for the plot or sounds fuzzy on paper. In practice, dehumanizing, abusing, and enslaving them is played for comedy. Yeah, try staying consistent to your own morals, movie. It helps, guys. Zori has a little chat with Poe, where he vents that he's overwhelmed with all the odds against the Resistance in the war. None of their allies seem willing to help. And then Zori says this. There's more of us. I mean, is there... Anyways, a now hacked and memory wiped 3PO reveals that the Wayfinder is on one of the moons of Endor. Kylo's Star Destroyer arrives, and Rey senses that Chewie is on it. So they sneak aboard the ship, and we get this admittedly funny gag with Rey pulling a mind trick on some stormtroopers. Drop your weapons! It's okay that we're here. It's okay that you're here. It's good. You're relieved that we're here. Thank goodness you're here. Welcome, guys. Did she do that to us? <laughs> yes, I will admit that did get some good laughs out of me in the theater. Ray splits up from Poe and Finn because the plot really wants Finn and Poe to get captured, as Kylo Ren force projects to Ray to give a shocking revelation. I never lied to you. Your parents were no one. They chose to be. To keep you safe. I know. Ray, be brave. Be safe here. I promise. They sold you to protect you. It was Palpatine who had your parents taken. He was looking for you. All right, multiple points here. One, you never lied to her? What the hell are you talking about? You didn't just tell Ray that her parents were nobody. You specifically said... They're filthy junk traders. Sold you off for drinking money. This film isn't even pretending to be consistent with The Last Jedi. Hate that film all you want. Rise of Skywalker had a responsibility to develop its characters from that film. Instead, it pretends like it didn't happen. This is not the Rey from the last movie. This is not the Kylo from the last movie. This is not a sequel to Last Jedi. Go fuck yourselves. Two, remember when I said earlier that Kylo only had one note to his character, that being his regret over killing his dad? Well, now he doesn't even have that. Now he's just an unenthusiastic exposition device that Abrams uses to explain things that contradict the last film. Three, her parents wanted to protect her by basically selling her into slavery on a near desolate planet? What kind of fucked up parents are these? It's not like you couldn't let her be raised in a safer environment. You're the children of the most powerful and influential politician in the galaxy. You're honestly telling me there's not a single friend or connection they have who would be willing to raise her somewhere safe? No wonder Palpatine wanted these morons dead. The stupidity is a disgrace to his name. Anyways, back with Finn, Poe, and Chewbacca, just when all hope seems lost. Oh, you're gonna let something off your chest, maybe now's not the worst time. <laughs> I'm the spy. What? Yup, Hux was the resistance spy. And I gotta admit, that's actually a pretty good twist. I never found Hux that compelling or convincing as the screaming, overacted Hitler wannabe from The Force Awakens, but I can totally buy him as the kind of weaselly, unsubstantial little twerp who would commit high treason to spite his rival. It wasn't predictable, but it still makes sense for the character and story. On top of that, Dom Hale Gleason gives one of the only consistently good performances in the movie, and I actually found to be pretty satisfying comic relief. Too bad he dies almost immediately after this. We really can't have good things in Rise of Skywalker. While Finn and Poe are escaping, Kylo catches up with Rey to, you guessed it, try to get her to join the dark side. And holy shit is Adam Driver's acting absolutely atrocious. Your father was the son of the Emperor. What Palpatine doesn't know is where a dyad in the Force, Rey. Two that are one. You know what you need to do. You know. You see that? That's the face of an actor who would rather be anywhere else but on this fucking set. His dry, bored out of his mind delivery only makes it even worse. I am shocked how this is somehow one of the more praised aspects of this film. This is a paycheck performance, plain and simple. 
Also, Raylo? Yeah, it sucks. There's not a single solitary reason for these two to be in love, especially after The Last Jedi, when Kylo completely betrayed Rey's trust and manipulated her to gain power for himself. They've hardly had any interaction in this film that wasn't vomited exposition, and his interactions with her in The Force Awakens extended to torturing her and trying to kill her in a forest. Where is the love? Where am I supposed to buy these characters care about each other? Anakin and Padme were close childhood friends who grew up in socially and emotionally stunted environments and leaned on each other for support and disinhibition. They were the only person they could be themselves around. It actually made sense why they were in love. Why are Kylo and Rey in love? Really, I, I want an answer. Before I can get one, though, Rey is saved by the power of shitty wire work and CGI. Yeah, remember when Force Awakens brought back the practical effects-heavy approach to Star Wars? And for all the film's faults, it was really, really convincing and impressive. Abrams can't even get the things he used to be good at right anymore. After that, Rey reflects a little more on this newfound knowledge of her parentage, teasing a possible turn to the dark side with a vengeful motive and the Emperor's theme playing in the background. You killed my mother. And my father. I'm going to find Palpatine. And destroy him. Rey, that doesn't sound like you. Ray, I know you. People know. keep telling me they know me. I'm afraid no one does. All right, here's the thing. Ray having a darker nature could have worked. It could have, especially given the events of The Last Jedi. She put all of her trust in Kylo, only to have him use and manipulate her. Luke straight up lied to her about not knowing her parentage, and she really doesn't have anything in the way of role models. Technically, Palpatine is in a position where he's the only person who knows Rey's past and hasn't been dishonest to her. Maybe she seeks Palpatine out, searching for answers, and open to hearing his side of the story. Or, if you really want to play up the angle that Rey wants revenge, maybe she heads back to Agent Kloss and encourages Leia to make more aggressive moves against the First Order, ones that humiliate Palpatine but result in a massive loss of Resistance lives. I may have even forgiven the Palpatine granddaughter twist. It's that cool of an idea. Maybe she even turns to the dark side at one point. Even if she does get redeemed at the end, this would still be a genuinely gutsy move that would have created actual emotional and dramatic stakes and a genuinely unpredictable story. But no, we don't get any of that. The film never implies beyond this line that there's anything dark about Rey's personality, because to do that would be to give the character actual flaws and shortcomings, something this film is mortally afraid of doing. So instead of actually exploring any darkness or tragic flaws that this character might have, the film decides to have her act like an emo 13-year-old who got their computer taken away. People keep telling me they know me. I'm afraid no one does. You might get my computer taken away, but I'll get it back, don't worry. So our heroes land on one of the moons of Endor and are having trouble finding the location of the Wayfinder. But it's okay because the Sith Dagger is actually a map that matches up exactly to the direction of where the Wayfinder is. Gee, good thing that Rey happened to be standing on the exact point on that exact hill to where the dagger lined up with the Death Star wreckage, which somehow managed to stay completely unmoving in the middle of stormy waters. Because if there was anything this script needed, it was more coincidences! After finding the location of the Wayfinder, we're then introduced to Janna, who may be the most racist character in the entire saga. I mean, don't get me wrong, Naomi Aki's performance is excellent, and one of the few good performances in the entire film, but the way this character is used, and how she's written, is absolutely disgusting. Her backstory is literally just a gender-bent version of Finn's, a stormtrooper who joined the Rebellion after witnessing a massacre. Because of course all black people in this joke of a trilogy have the exact same same history. And of course, we later find out she's the daughter of Lando, because we can't have any black characters who aren't related to each other either. If this wasn't bad enough, her only purpose in the narrative is to keep Finn away from Rose or Rey, because Lilith forbid we have a mixed race romantic couple in these movies. Can't risk pissing off the alt-right childhood justice warriors, can we? Remember when blue check marks on Twitter tried to argue that George Lucas was the real racist for Jar Jar? Even though the accent, the physical mannerisms, basically everything they found offensive about the character came from Ahmed Best, who their criticism actively took agency away from as an actor? But this is the progressive Star Wars trilogy, right guys? And a lot of times, you know, I hear people say, we're not talking about you, we're talking about Jar Jar. We're talking about me. 
I put a lot of me into that work. And if you talk to any artist, and you talk to any artist who really cares about their work, you're talking about them. The hardest part for me in that entire situation was all of the criticism that came from uh, a racially motivated point of view. Growing up being black, and wanting to be an artist, which is a very challenging and brave thing to do. It's not easy. We're always faced as black artists with this idea of being a sellout, right? We have our guard up when it comes to being portrayed as an Uncle Tom, a racial stereotype, or anything that makes you as a black person look less than. It hit me, it came right for me. I was called every racial stereotype you can imagine. There was this like criticism on being this Jamaican broken dialect, which was offensive because I'm of West Indian descent, I'm not Jamaican. You're, you're a fucking idiot. Uh, at least the Orbacks are pretty cool. You can tell there's a lot of influence from step culture and their riders, and the animals themselves have this really interesting design that's almost halfway between a horse and a wild boar. They're probably some of my favorite Star Wars creatures. Shame we only see them in the worst Star Wars movie. The Force. The Force brought me here. Brought me to Ray and Poe. Do you say that like you're sure it's real? It's real. I'm real. Finn and Poe try to make a strategy on how best to get to the Wayfinder, but it turns out that Rey is already ahead of them as she sails a boat through hurricane winds to get to the wreckage. Okay. I can buy that someone who has never even held a lightsaber before defeated an extremely powerful dark Jedi in a duel. I can buy that a wandering scavenger knows how to fly and repair a ship better than its owner, who's probably the best pilot in the galaxy. I can buy that a wanted woman with a bounty on her head is instantly liked by a bounty hunter after beating her up. But if you honestly expect me to buy that a fucking desert nomad knows how to steer a boat that looks like it was stapled together by a fifth grader for a homework assignment through storm force winds and hurricane waves, you are on fucking death sticks! Back with Poe and Finn, the film finally realizes that it hasn't developed any of its characters even an ounce, so we get this extremely forced enmity and bitching that comes right the hell out of nowhere. You have no idea what she's fighting. And you do? Yeah, I do. And so does Leia. Well, I'm not Leia. That's for damn sure. Christ, the acting sucks in this film. You can totally tell that Boyega and Isaac buy this artificial tension between their characters about as much as the audience does, and they don't even attempt to make their quarreling look genuine. It's an endurance test at this point. How much shitty characterization and absurd writing can these actors sit through before they finally get paid? Again, John Boyega and Oscar Isaac are great actors. John Boyega in particular gave possibly the best performance in the trilogy in The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, but not under this contrived screenplay that that gives him nothing to work with. With all the pointless yelling and unfunny comedy, Boyega comes across like a bad parody of his performance in the first two films. Back with Rey, she climbs up the wreckage of the Death Star before... Wait, what the hell is that facial expression? Did Daisy really just smell a fart or something? Oops! Oh, what, what? I hope I didn't stain my underwear. Ah, look at that. Skid marks. Anyways, Rey enters the Emperor's chambers and encounters a dark side mirror of herself. And I'll confess, dark side Rey is pretty cool. It's probably the only time in the film where Daisy Ridley is allowed to actually act, and definitely the only time she's allowed to have any fun. I especially love this little bit here where she hisses and gives this sharp-toothed scowl at Rey. Really surprisingly convincing as an evil villain, and I'd actually like to see her in more villain roles in the future. This is a fun scene, and I was genuinely enjoying myself when it finally happened even if a potentially interesting and thought-provoking character concept really did just get reduced to filler. 
Also impressive is the lightsaber fight that follows between Rey and Kylo, after he finally tracks her down. I'll even go on record saying it's easily the best lightsaber fight of the trilogy. The choreography is raw, gritty, and realistic. The scenery is visually stunning and provides a neat little parallel to Anakin and Obi-Wan's duel on Mustafar, and the sound design really gets to stand out here with a general lack of music. Best of all, it ends on an incredibly shocking manner, as Rey actually kills Kylo Ren by stabbing him with his own lightsaber. <laughs> See, this is what I was talking about when I said there was potential in Rey's darker nature. Her killing Kylo makes a lot of sense, given that her kindness to him was almost always rewarded with manipulation or abuse. She can only offer her hand so many times to someone so warped and irredeemable. It also makes her prime for Palpatine to exploit that frustration and anger at everyone who used her. So all that dark side teasing finally has some payoff. This may be the one interesting character moment that Rey has had in the entire fit. So, not only do you undo maybe the only remotely interesting or thought-provoking character moment that this plastic nothing action figure of a protagonist actually has in this entire movie, but you additionally confirm that with no on-screen training or journey whatsoever, she literally has the gift to bring people back from death with the Force. So now, not only is this trilogy fucked with this utter train wreck disaster of a capper, not only does Consequence not exist in this universe anymore, but Anakin Skywalker's tragic journey in the prequel trilogy of turning to the dark side out of inability to save the ones he loves from death is completely null and void! So, after Abrams finally kills Star Wars, Rey flies away for some reason, and we cut back to Agent Kloss, where Leia has died. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. She forced Skype called Kylo in the middle of his duel with Rey, which is why she had the opportunity to stab him, but at this point, it doesn't even matter. Chewbacca seems particularly devastated by this loss, and it's incredibly depressing how the only convincing emotional beat in this film is delivered by a character who can't speak. <laughs> Back with Kylo, he broods on the Death Star wreckage before being visited by the ghost of Han Solo. Because if there's one thing Chris Terrio loves, it's ambiguous soul-searching with ghost ads. BVS jokes aside, in theory, this scene should be really emotional and impactful, but it just isn't. Adam Driver's acting is just awful, he hardly emotes at all. Granted, I don't think he's changed his facial expression for this entire movie, but this is supposed to be his most emotional moment of his entire arc, and I feel nothing. The repetition of the Force Awakens dialogue is also incredibly forced and utterly meaningless. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. If Han's ghost is real, then I doubt he wants to hear the last words his son told him before he stabbed him and pushed him off a bridge. If Han's ghost isn't real, this just comes across as self-pitying bullshit from a character who thinks he's way more substantial than he actually is. The worst part of this whole scene is when he throws his lightsaber. It's supposed to be this big dramatic gesture, but he just tosses it like it's nothing. I don't feel any character change with Kylo at all, I'm merely hearing it. This kind of tell-don't-show filmmaking goes against everything these films should stand for. Look at Return of the Jedi with the subtle body language of David Prowse and humbled cadence of James Earl Jones telling us all we need to know about Vader's remorse and slow change back to the light, all while repeating to the audience over and over again in the dialogue that he has no conflict. I will not turn, and you'll be forced to kill me. If that is your destiny, it is too late for me. Son. It's a phenomenal understanding of the cinematic language that Rise of Skywalker just isn't interested in at all. Anyways, the First Order's entire armada all has plant-destroying weapons now, with Kajimi being first on the chopping block. I can only hope that Babu Frick was still on it and was in as much agony as possible. We get more abysmal, weird mime acting from Mary, part of the course, really. The Emperor sent a ship from Exegol. 
Does that mean every ship in the fleet has planet-killing weapons? Before we get the revelation that Poe and Lando are generals now. Yeah, forget that Poe was a reckless loose cannon whose strategy was repeatedly condemned by Leia in The Last Jedi. Disengage now, Commander. That is an order. And that Lando is a diplomat who barely has any military experience at all. Military hierarchy is now decided by how much screen time you have in these films. Back with Rey, she's destroying her TIE fighter for, again, no reason, all while Daisy Ridley decides to give us her best Tommy Wiseau impression. Seriously, this is absolutely Razzie-worthy. I have no idea how Hayden and Natalie got nominations for the prequels when this Z-grade shit gets a pass. But before Rey can say she fed up with his world, Luke catches her lightsaber when she throws it into the bonfire. Himmel gives his only good line delivery in the entire film. A Jedi's weapon deserves more respect. Before realizing what an anti-artistic nightmare he's in and phoning it in like nearly everyone else. What are you doing? Also, can we mention how bad that Force Ghost CGI is? He never once looks like he's not acting on a separate green screen from Daisy Ridley, and the bright blue hue is just weird. It's the kind of Uncanny Valley trash we had no problem calling out in Justice League. Eh, at least Luke kept his beard. So Luke gives Rey Leia's lightsaber to face Palpatine, and we get this really uncomfortable, kinda Randian line from Luke. A thousand generations live in you now. Remember when TLJ tried to dispel the idea that Star Wars was all about bloodlines? Man, I really didn't appreciate that at the time like I do now. Back with C-3PO, R2-D2 just casually restores all of his memory back because, again, consequences don't exist in this universe. Man, remember when we all watched the trailer for this thing and the end of it hyped up this line from C-3PO that he had before his memory got wiped? What, uh, what are you doing there, 3 po Taking one last look, sir, at my friends. I don't think I've seen marketing this insidiously misleading since the devil inside. Remind me to review that shit someday. If you think that's breaking the rules though, get a load of this shit. The First Order apparently has no shields for their ships on Exegol. And why don't they have shields? Because according to Poe, you can't activate shields unless you're above atmosphere. Yeah, it's not like the rebel shield generators protecting the base on Hoth's atmosphere was a major plot point for the first act of Empire Strikes Back, right? It's not like shield generators protecting the Gungan army on Naboo was a major plot point in The Phantom Menace, right? Where are these ideas even coming from? And in case you're arguing that the First Order Star Destroyers could just go above atmosphere, Poe has an even dumber explanation for that as well, which just so happens to be right. Apparently, the Star Destroyers are so large in size that they can't tell which way is up. Let me repeat that. The most advanced military in the galaxy can't tell when their ships are going up. On ships with giant windows. Yeah, I stand by my previous statement. And Ron Hubbard absolutely wrote this film. You imbecile! What kind of crap lousy game are you playing? Okay, so real talk, this is originally supposed to just be one video, but making this review has just been incredibly depressing and emotionally draining for me. It's really a chore, and I push through it because I like to think I have some strong points and decent jokes, but this is the first time since I started my Diamonds of the Rough reviews where reviewing has felt like work rather than something I actually enjoy. I'm used to talking about films that I like, and I feel like that general air of positivity in most of my reviews is what generally separates me from a lot of the pack. So, bad news is, this is going to be a two-parter. Don't know when I'll upload part two, but I'm hoping I can at least get it done before the end of the year. The good news is, this will give me more time to focus on things I'm more passionate about. MVs, writing screenplays, and just focusing my energy in more generally positive outlets. I may even have my Revenge of the Sith Diamonds of the Rough review up before part two. If you like seeing me talk about things I dislike, please let me know in the comments. This video is more of an experiment, if anything, and if you enjoy it, there's plenty of other hated blockbusters I'd love to break down my reasoning for loathing. Regardless, thank you to everyone who's continued to support my videos and engage in my content. I'm a very small channel, and most of my fans and viewers are people who I would genuinely consider to be my friends, so every bit of love I get is something I really take to heart, and I really appreciate all of you no matter how much we disagree. I have some really neat surprises in store for my channel in 2021, and I can promise you that your following will be well rewarded. I'll see you when I'm feeling better, and hopefully we can slay this dragon once and for all.